to be website accessibility, which relates to how people with varying disabilities access your website and making sure that they're able to access and interact with your website to as, to as great a degree as possible. Before we do that, though, I do want to um, look at a couple of things. Um, first of all, I want to <coughs> introduce a term that we didn't use the term last week, but we talked about the concepts last week. And the term that I want to introduce is responsive web design. All right. Responsive web design. You'll see that a lot, and really what that relates to is making your page, in effect, respond to the device that it's on. Respond to in terms of how wide the screen is, and, and so on. So a lot of things that we were doing last time via CSS, <coughs> excuse me, um, allowed the website to look different uh, in different screens. You know, for wider screen versus a narrower screen, and so on. And all these techniques to do so fall under the umbrella of responsive web design. So um, I thought that would be a good term to introduce just in case you hear people talking about it. Or if you want to research and do more work, uh, want to learn a little bit more about this, the, the key word here is responsive web design. The other thing is I've had a number of requests for people that wanted to know how you would take a website live. In other words, I've developed a, a website that is running on my machine. I've developed a set of web pages. How do I make that available to the rest of the world? So we'll spend a little bit of time talking about that as well. All right. First of all, let's let's talk a bit about the way the internet works. All right, and this I may have drawn this diagram before. If, uh, if I did, this will be a repeat, but I think it's important to understand how it works. We have what's called a client and a server. A client is that entity, that system, person in combination with their device, whether it be a laptop or a desktop or a mobile device, that's connected to the internet and is making requests for web pages. Well, what is a request for a web page? A request for a web page is when you type in www.google.com. That's making a request for a certain web page. Or if I type in, if I click a link, I don't even have to type in a, a web page, but if I click a link on LC's homepage for computer information systems degrees, it'll, that's a request for LC's server to deliver that page. So anytime in, in computing when you hear the term client server, a client is an entity that is making requests. Now in our case, those requests are for web pages. The server responds to the request, all right, satisfies the request, or somehow answers the request. It could answer with an error, right? If you type in a web page that doesn't exist, you might get a 404 error that says, hey, I can't find, the web server says, hey, I can't find this web page. All right, but the server responds to that. 
So when you're connected to the internet, you type in or click a link, your request gets routed to the internet, from, through the internet, to the server, the server processes that request and delivers back to the client the web page and CSS files and, and all the files the, the browser needs on the other end to display the page. The internet is represented as a cloud because we're not too concerned about exactly what happens in there. All right. In other words, somehow the request makes it there. It's actually an involved process by which the request makes it from your computer to the web server. It bounces around through a variety of servers before it makes its final destination. Similar to the way like if, you, if, you, uh, if, if FedEx uh, mailed you a pack, or if you ordered a package and FedEx would send it to one place and send it to another, then send it to another before it makes it to your door. All right, same sort of idea. It gets bounced around a little bit. Now, in this equation, both you and the server have an IP address. An IP address is sort of your address on the internet. We're going to consider the most basic cases here and not consider any involved cases. Um, recently, because of all the use of mobile devices and so on, they've actually expanded the, the size of IP addresses. Um, but typically, an IP address is, uh, consists of four three-digit numbers. So this might be an IP address. of someone. Who knows? Don't type it in your browser. You never know what you're going to get. All right. These three numbers go from, uh, these three digit numbers though aren't any three digit numbers. They're numbers from 0 to 255. That's what identifies you on the internet. And as a client you have one and a web server has one. Now, depending on the kind of client that you have, you may have an IP address that's assigned to you permanently, or you may get a different IP address every time you connect up. All right, like with dial-up, typically you get a, a new IP address every time you you uh, you connect up. All right. For web servers, those IP addresses are going to be permanent or relatively permanent. In other words, they're not going to they're not going to change too often. Now, it would be very awkward if instead of going to Google, we had to memorize what Google's IP address was and type that into the browser every time, right? We want to go to Google, you know? What is Google's IP address? No one knows, yet everyone has accessed Google. How is that possible? Because there are what are called domain name servers. Or DNS. And there's a bunch of these, which is good. It's good that there's a bunch of these because if one of them breaks down, it doesn't crash the whole internet. There's redundancies. It, you know, if it can't make it by one path, it can make it by some other path. It would be like if a road was closed and FedEx was going to deliver your package, if road A was closed, it could take road B to get to your house. All right, same idea. So that's why it's good that there's redundancy with these domain name servers. These domain name servers translate the name of the domain, in other words, www.google.com or lorraineccc.edu or any number of different URLs, translates those into right because that's what that's what the network and that's what everything needs to make the request is the IP address but IP addresses aren't very convenient for humans to work with so there's the domain name server that takes the name which are easier for people to remember and translate that into an IP address all right so 
The server then, when it gets the request, returns it back to the IP address that made the request. Now, we've been talking so far in this course about just plain old HTML pages, in which case the server has a very easy job. The server simply goes and needs to deliver the package of code from the browser to the server. All right? Or, or I'm sorry, from the server to the browser, all the way around. With server-side scripting, the server does a more complex job. The, the server actually runs a little program to create a web page and then delivers the results to the browser. All right, so what does this have to do with you setting up your website? Well, it points, off, points, off, points up the need for two different things. Number one, you need to register a domain. All right. Obviously, there can't be two websites using the name www.google.com. Wouldn't work, right? Someone has to keep tabs on that, and someone has to keep control of that. And therefore, if you want to go and register your website, www.yournamehere.com, there has to be some organization that keeps tabs on, has anyone else already registered that? And if they have, well, then you can't register that. The organization that sort of oversees all this is called ICANN. And I forget what the letters stand for. I was just looking at it a minute before class to refresh my memory, and, and it didn't work, because I don't remember what the, what the letters stand for. But they're responsible for sort of keeping track of the domains. They're responsible for the top-level DNS, the top-level domain ser uh, name servers. There's actually a whole bunch of DNS servers. Again, it's that redundancy that sort of keeps the internet alive if something fails. And if you make a change to a domain name server, sometimes it takes a little while to make it to all the domain name servers. That's called propagating the, D the, DNS, um, the, 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 the DNS servers. Therefore, if I were to register a URL this minute, I might not be able to access it for maybe up to a day later on all computers throughout the whole world. Day or two maybe at the, at the most. All right. So the ICANN is responsible for registering a domain, and they're, in, they're responsible for maintaining sort of the top-level domain name servers. And all the other domain name servers throughout the world get their information from that. And that's what keeps everything consistent. So when you type in www.google.com, you always go to www.google.com. You don't mistakenly end up somewhere else. All right. ICANN is also responsible for defining what are called top-level domains. In other words, .com, .net, .edu, .gov, and so on. If you notice, you can't just have any old thing after, at the end of your, your domain name. It's lorraineccc.edu. It is, you know, google.com. You can't have anything. No, that, those sort of last several letters are what are called the top-level domain, and ICANN is also responsible for defining those. And, ma and maintaining, for example, that, that only valid educational institutions get a .edu um, um, extension, and so on. All right, so the first thing you have to do is you have to register the domain. You can do that with any number of different organizations. Many organizations allow you to register a domain. Even though ICANN is ultimately responsible for it, they sort of farm out the actual registration process to some of these other organizations. All right, So they sort of manage the whole show, but you can register it with any number of different people. And oftentimes, you'll register it, your domain with the same people that provide you service number two. And that is web hosting. What is web hosting? Web hosting is 
giving you access to a web server and a certain amount of space to put your files. If you've completed a, an assignment for this class, it doesn't mean that your friend in California can access it, right? Because your pages, your files are not on a web server. What is a web server? A web server is a machine that's connected to the internet. All right, well, you might say, well, my machine is connected to the internet. But in addition to being connected to the internet, it has the software installed that listens and responds to, that's waiting for, that's expecting, and, and responding to requests that the clients around the world can make. So it's running web server software. There's two main web server software uh, applications in use. And one of them is called Apache. And one of them is called IIS. IIS is Microsoft's web server software. Apache is an open source. Actually, Apache is probably the most used web server throughout the world, believe it or not. At least typically in the past it has been. I would imagine it still is. So, when you contract with a web hosting company, you will either get a shared host or a dedicated host. A shared host means that your stuff is on a computer with other folks' stuff. All right? You share the space. Now, from the outside world's viewpoint, no one can tell you're on a shared server or not. You still have a domain name. It still goes to the web server. You still get your pages. It, it seems like it's a, it's a server on its own. But in reality, physically, the web server contains a bunch of different sites, not just the one site. A dedicated server would be where you have a server dedicated just to you. All right? Now, if you're a large organization, you may provide this service for yourself. You may have the IT staff that can manage that. But what web hosting companies provide are things such as um, security, backing up the files. So if, that, if the server crashes, they can restore the files. Security, if there are security vulnerabilities discovered in the web server software, you know, it's their job to maintain those servers so they can patch them for you. They can apply the fixes to that. Whereas for most individuals or small organizations, you know, that's a full-time job to, to keep tabs on those sorts of things, and they don't really have the personnel to do that. So most Smaller organizations are, and even some many larger organizations, are very comfortable sort of farming that out to a web hosting company. All right, so two things you have to do. You have to register a domain, and you have to obtain the services of a, of, of a web host. Again, you could create your own web server and manage it, more than likely you will contract with a web hosting company that will either set up a shared server for you or a, um, uh, a, a dedicated server. Let's look at a couple web hosting companies and see what deals they have. One of the most famous is GoDaddy. I don't particularly like them, but a lot of people do. And they give you a deal where you can register a domain, plus they give you tools to build a website, plus email for a dollar a month. That's pretty inexpensive. All right. So you can go search a domain. CISS216.com. Let's see if that is available. That name is not available, interestingly enough. Actually, someone has it and is selling it, 
interestingly enough. I can search again. Let's look up CISS 216 Zellers. I'll be surprised if that one has been registered. What? It says, sorry, that name is not available for registration. Please try again. Here's a list of names. Oh, I don't think they like the www in front of it. And then good news, this domain is available. All right, and so we're, then we could go and get it. And we could register it for two years or more for two ninety nine, and so on. They have a list of what their products are and what they have. There's a domain, domain name. Um, if we look at web hosting services, there's an economy for three forty nine a month. Deluxe for four nine forty nine a month and so on. You can have for, for this one, the basic one, you can have web one website, hundred gigabyte storage, unlimited bandwidth, and, and so on. They give you a free domain with that. So that's one example. So you can see it's pretty in, inexpensive to do that. In fact, one thing I suggest to some of my students is considering creating your own domain to use sort of as your sandbox and, and, and sort of as a, as a portfolio. In other words, if you're looking for a job as a web developer, you can actually put samples of your work up on the web and simply direct people to go there. All right? It's kind of rare for someone to be able to apply for a job in that way by actually demonstrating live what they can do. All right? For example, if you're applying a job if you're applying for a job as a what? Nuclear uh, engineer, all right? You couldn't say, well, look, I have a power plant in my backyard that I maintain and it provides electricity for me, all right? You can't really do that, all right? There's a lot of equipment involved and legal ramifications and so on. So you have to sell them on your credentials, you know, that maybe you worked at someone else's place or you have such and such degree from school or whatever. With website development, you can actually show people you can do the job by demonstrating and showing them examples of where you have done the job. And so I encourage my students to put, uh, or to create a web hosting, uh, or, or to uh, employ a web hosting service and register a domain to sort of show off their work. Another organization that does this, the one that I use, is called Hosting Matters. And they have similar deals. For six bucks a month, you get 70 megabytes, so a little bit, a little less space. You get uh, 20 gigs of transfer per month and some other things. Now one thing that, for, for what we do in this class, we do just basic HTML files. Any web server would, would work with that. For more advanced server-side applications, you'd have to make sure that the server that you're um, using, the web hosting company that you're providing, handles that particular server-side scripting language. For example, ASP.NET or PHP or whatever. It's not like it's hard to do, but you have to make sure you have to dot that I and cross the T because not all web servers can handle all the server-side scripting languages. All of them, however, can handle um, basic HTML. All right, so. You go out and you, you find a web hosting company and maybe through them or maybe through some org other organization, you register your domain. Now, usually I like registering my domain with my web hosting company because they can sort of ensure that things happen seamlessly rather than have two different organizations dealing with the transaction. 
It's important because, again, what does registering a domain do? It points the actual URL to an IP address. So when I register a domain, what I'm really doing is, is I'm saying this name goes to this IP address. All right? And since the IP address you're going to get from your web hosting company, it, might, it sort of makes sense to register your domain with them as well. It sort of makes it a little more seamless. So what do you do then? You need to get your code from your machine where it's working up to that web server. That web server that is accessible to the outside world. That is done through an, a program called an FTP program. Now, some web hosting companies give you what's called like a control panel that sort of simplifies this step. Or you can use any number of freely available FTP programs to do this. If your web hosting company provides you with a control panel, uploading code to your website will be very similar to uploading a file to Angel, right? You'll go in, you'll find where you want to put it, you'll click the files that you want to upload, click upload, and there they'll go. FTP is a little more complicated, but really not all that complicated. What I'm going to do is I'm going to FTP our sample code from one of the lectures in this class up to a web server that we have here on campus, provided that the web server is working today. All right. So let me go and do that. Let me first of all pull down one of our examples from a previous lecture. All right, so I'm going to go pull down this example. I'm going to then go and I am going to Let me see what software we have available on this machine. Not a lot. Um, there is a free application that I use a lot called FileZilla, which is good for transferring. But through Windows Explorer, you can transfer as well. What I'm going to do is I'm going to type in, in the Windows Explorer, FTP, not HTTP, but FTP slash slash CISSQL dot Lorraine CCC dot EDU. That is my domain. All right, that is my domain. That's where, uh, that's what we use for a number of different things on campus. But whatever your domain would be, you would, you would connect to that server. You're going to get asked for a username and password, which makes sense, right? You, you certainly don't want anyone in the world to come and change your code, right? Or put their own files up on your web server. So this isn't for requesting pages. This isn't what clients will do when they're requesting pages. This is what you, the developer, will be doing when you want to upload pages. So I'm going to put in my username and password. I'm going to try to remember my password. I'm 
going to click log on. And notice what I get. I get a series of folders, but these are not folders on my machine here. These are folders up on that web server. So what I can do is I can actually go and I can make, I, I can treat this just like I would folders on my machine. I can go and say new folder and I'm going to create it called CISS216. And then I can go and copy files over from my machine to that web server. So there it's going and it's copying the files over. So now the files are up there on the internet and available to be accessed by anyone in the world, provided they know the URL. I don't have any links to them or anything. All right. How would you access them? Well, This part is my domain name. That part is the folder that I created. The next folder that I created. All I'm doing is specifying the folders down the line that I put the code up in. And if I typed everything well, that page comes up. So the bottom line, sort of to summarize, how do you take your website live? Sort of a three-step process. Two of the steps you can sort of accomplish with the same service or same organization. The first step of the process is to register a domain and oftentimes you can do that at the same time of obtaining a web hosting company services. In very rare cases you could set up the server yourself but again typically an individual or a small organization will let someone else do that for them and pay them the small amount. You notice what the, what the cost was to, for, for a website. It was so minimal that, you know, it, you know it, it's worth, you know, some of those sites for GoDaddy's were going for less than $5 a month. So, for, you know, for less than $60 a year, you know, you're going you're gonna to spend that much uh, time in aggravation dealing with security patches and, keeping your machine from hackers and backing up your website and so on. All right. So, register a domain. Get a web host. Usually it will be from an outside service. And again, many times you sort of combine those two into one step. Then, you need to transfer the code from your machine to the web server. And in doing that, sometimes web hosting companies will provide you a control panel that's right on their website that you can go and navigate to to get to and upload files and that would be very similar to what you do in Angel. Or you can use any FTP program and with an FTP program you have to be able to connect to the server so you need to know the URL which is the URL that you registered. You need, it has to be enabled for FTPing, and you have to supply your credentials. In other words, when you employ the web uh, hosting company, they'll give you a user ID and password for your location on their site. And then, once you do that, you can treat, through FTP, the folders on that remote site just like you'd treat folders on your own computer. You can create folders, you can upload, you can copy files over, you could delete files, you do whatever you need to do. All right? Um, and then, once you do that, 
the folders that you create and the files that you upload, the folders that you create provide the path to that. The initial folder that we logged on to, this one is the web server's root. All right. In other words, that simply CISS SQL slash or CISS um, CIS SQL dot Lorraine CCC dot edu. Each folder underneath it then is another slash folder name. So here I created CISS 216. Here I created mobile. Here I created progressive enhancement. And then you specify the files and you can copy the files up there. All right. If you've done everything correctly, then stuff should work. Now, what are some things that you could possibly do incorrectly? One of the things is using what are called absolute paths rather than relative paths to your files. In other words, if I do an image, I want to do images like this. And this is something I sort of warned you about earlier in the semester. I don't do something like file C colon and then the directory because once I move that from my machine up to the web server, that path is no longer going to be valid. So what do I want to do? Well, if it's in the same folder as the code, all I have to do is put the image name between the quotes. If it's in a folder underneath it called images, then I put the folder name images slash quotes. So I'm supplying what's called a relative path. I'm not saying exactly precisely where it's located on my disk. I'm specifying, well, from the source code, you go down to a folder called images, and then you supply that. Once you upload it, though, it's a good idea to test it because Images, links, pointing to CSS files, all, if they're done correctly, will work fine, but if you use the wrong kind of path to get to them, could cause a problem. All right? It's just like Angel as well, in that you have to move all the files up there. So you can't simply move the HTML file. You'd have to move the HTML file along with the CSS file, along with any image files that you'd have. Questions over any of this? All right. One thing has come to my attention. People have been asking me questions about browser compatibility um, issues, and I did want to say a word about that um, before we finish today. First of all, the real, real proof of browser compatibility is to actually run some tests. In other words, view it in different browsers, get your friends to view it. Um, we saw that there were some online tools that you could use to test across multiple browsers, but there's really no substitute for that. Your first check is to go and make sure your code is valid, because we know that bad code can lead to browser compatibility issues. But even if your code is perfect, you're still potentially vulnerable to browser compatibility issues. One thing I will say though, browser compatibility doesn't mean that the page is going to look identical across all browsers. It just ought to be workable across all browsers. A few students in my class have been experimenting with fixed positioning. Fixed positioning in CSS is where you say something is at a certain spot and it stays there even if you scroll the window. So if you specify that it's 10 pixels from the top with a fixed position, normally with absolute position, if I scrolled, it would go off the page. But with fixed positioning, it stays on the page. All right? So that's something cool to try with. Well, unfortunately, that doesn't work across all browsers. For some browsers, there's an issue with that. However, as long as it works and it's workable, in the different browsers, then you've done your job. It doesn't need to 
act or behave identical across all browsers. All right? So, don't confuse browser compatibility with the site or the pages being identical pixel by pixel on every platform. If there's some variance between platforms, as long as the user can use it and is workable, that's not an issue. All right. Your program your, your project design is due next week. All right. Are there any questions about that? This is going to become a very important thing as the, the course winds down. So please bring any questions that you do have to class. All right. Questions? Going once, twice. I do have an example online. Um, that example is just that, an example. It's not meant to be copied verbatim. You don't have to do it in the exact format as I do it. But it's sort of to give you some ideas about what I'm expecting. All right. In addition to the design document, which I've created an example for, um, you ought to create a prototype, which is sort of a working draft version of your web pages done in HTML. All right. So in addition to turning in the, the documentation in a Word document, you also want to turn in um, some sample pages in HTML. Questions? This is a rare day indeed when I finish early. All right. So uh, I, I'm done for today. Uh, the next topic that we'll pick up on Wednesday is website accessibility. All right. Let's go to lab. Are we okay in Ridgeville? Are we are we set in Ridgeville? Did you have a question? Oh, okay. <laughs>